Welcome to the first ever Rancho Penasquitas Community Candidate Forum for San Diego City Council District 5. Welcome Joe Leventhal and Marnie Van Wilpert. Thank you very much for being here. The community is thrilled to have you with us and we look forward to hearing your answers to the questions that you've received that our uh, constituents have submitted for your um, response. So we want to hear from both of you and uh, welcome, welcome to our viewers. We appreciate you taking the time to join us here tonight. This is for you and please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we have six that have already been submitted. So if we have time, we will field the additional questions, but put them in the comment box and we will get those answered even no matter what, right? We'll get them answered. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put on the comment section so we can see uh, our community's comments. So feel free to leave any comments. And uh, with that, would you like to make an opening statement? You both get a minute. <laughs> Go for it. Go ahead, Barney. Would you like to start? Oh, sure. All right. Um, well, thank you, Kate, for hosting us. And hi, Joe. It's good to see you as always. Okay. Um, and thanks to everyone for attending tonight. My name is Marnie Von Wilpert. I am running for San Diego City Council for our district to um, take Mark Kersey's seat when he turns out. And I am from here. I grew up in Scripps Ranch. I actually live down the street from the house I grew up in, where my parents still live. And um, I was over there bringing them dinner tonight. So I just, I'm sorry, I rushed home to come in and make sure I got to talk to everybody. Uh, I'm actually coming up on my 20th high school reunion with Scripps Ranch High School, and we're planning what to do next year because we're not sure if we'll be able to not, um, you know, get, get together in person yet. But I'm a deputy city attorney. I prosecute environmental polluters here in the city. I'm a civil prosecutor. I go after corporations that break the law. I'm also going after um, the opioid industry for its fraud and all the addiction that it caused and the burden on our 911 and health systems. And um, right now they've got me prosecuting price gougers and COVID scammers of all things. But I'm running to make sure that we take care of our public health crisis first and foremost, keep us healthy. And that will be the key to keeping our economy open. We have to keep shutting down, opening, shutting down. I wanna make sure we protect our environment, keep our air, water, park speeches clean uh, for the next generation and fight climate change and prevent wildfires is a big part of that for me. I also wanna get people back to work you know, fixing our roads, infrastructure, public works projects, and a lot of green infrastructure projects I'll talk about tonight. I want to make sure we all have housing we can afford to live in and access to good jobs to help us get there. And I'm running to make sure that everyone knows that our government's going to treat everybody with dignity and respect and equality, no matter who you are, who you love, what faith you describe in, um, you should all be treated with dignity and respect. So thanks for having me tonight. Thank you for being here. Joe, please. Great. Well, thank you, Kate. Uh, it's it's good to see you virtually again. Uh, <laughs> I miss the days where we could uh, help kick off the opening of the uh, of the little league season like we did uh, last year. But uh, hopefully, that something was, that was good. It was good. It was a great, <laughs> great community event. Yes. Um, well, you know, I I uh, moved down here when I found San Diego by way of college. Went to UC San Diego, which is where I met my wife after law school and working in DC briefly. Uh, moved back here in two thousand four. And my wife and I have lived here ever since. Uh, we are raising three children, and that's really a big reason why I decided to run. I'm concerned about the fact that San Diego, over the last 15 or 20 years, continues to kick the can down the road and not really uh, meaningfully address the problems that we have as, as a region. And uh, you know, the homeless challenge was really uh, chief among them. When we saw the hepatitis crisis, and we saw our elected leaders pointing fingers at each other instead of really rolling up their sleeves and trying to figure out what we needed to do to get things done and, and get people well and get more people off the streets. Uh, and so that was a big motivating factor of why I decided, frankly, to resign from the city's ethics commission, which I was serving as an ethics commissioner. Um, I've done a lot of community work in, in San Diego. I'm very proud of the work I've done for a nonprofit for kids with disabilities. I've been an advocate for the disability community frankly, since I was in college and, and student leadership there. I'm currently a business owner and a lawyer. Uh, so Marty and I are both lawyers. I like to joke that's the worst thing about me and you know, being a lawyer. Uh, but, uh, you know, people love lawyers. Uh, so, you know, I'm a lawyer, but a business owner as well. And uh, I, I really think we need that business experience in city council. Uh, we frankly don't have as 
uh, diverse in, uh, of perspective in our in our leadership in San Diego as we as we maybe did five or ten years ago. And I think it's important to have that diversity of experience in city council. Um, in terms of going forward, you know, in short, I want to keep your taxes low and your roads paved. Uh, those are really two big priorities of mine. Obviously, with a, with a budget crisis at the city because of COVID, it's important to bring our economy back to get people working again, to get people economically secure so they're not in fear of losing their job or losing the roof over their head. So I really want to focus on that, particularly going forward in the, in the next year and bringing back a lot of tourism dollars that I think will really help not only people's uh, pockets, but it'll help our city budget as well. So look forward to answering the questions tonight and talking more about those issues. Okay. So you all, you both have received copies of the the community questions and I'll begin with the first one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna use the timer, okay? I'm just, and I will just hold up the phone like this to, you know, to, to it, cause I know we only get an hour with you. So I just want to, I'm not gonna be, you know, beating, beating anybody over the head, but I'm gonna raise this nasty little thing so you can see it. I'm gonna go, oh, so um, since we have six questions, I. I'm thinking if we, you know, if we give four minutes per question, then there'll be a little bit of time to go back and forth and, and still field other questions that are coming in. So question number one, uh, on September 29th, 2020, the city council unanimously voted to amend the municipal code to create the office of race and equity. If elected, how will you prioritize diversity, equity, inclusion and inclusion in district five okay so i'm going to go from my side right to left left to right so joe please respond great uh, just for clarification is it four minutes total or or no, four? each okay just checking i want to talk okay. to you more. thank you yes. so uh, i i support the city council's creation uh, of the office of race and equity uh, I, I wrote an op-ed uh, when we were talking a lot in the city initially about uh, police reform, and that was one of the one of the things I explicitly said that I support. Frankly, I would like to see that office expand beyond race. I think there are a lot of metrics that we should be looking at in the city when it comes to things like employment practices, uh, city contracts, uh, beyond just race. I think we should be looking at, for example, what percentage of our government contracts go to veteran-owned businesses. Uh, what uh, percentage go to women-owned businesses. There are a lot of different metrics that I think we should know and make sure that we are trying to uh, treat people in an equitable way with dollars that are spent from the city and in our hiring practices. And so I think it's an important office that is probably really late in its creation. It's something that I think we should have created years ago. But again, I really would like to see it broader than just race. That's not the only uh, statistic or demographic that we should be concerned about as a city council and as a city. Um, so again, in terms of District 5, I think it's it's certainly uh, very important. Uh, as, a, as an employer, uh, I have been very committed to hiring a diverse staff. Uh, it's part of why I was endorsed by the, the La Raza Lawyers Association, uh, because my, my history of hiring diverse staff, having actually a higher uh, percentage of Latinos on my team than even in the general population, uh, in my work with the legal community, in my volunteer service, I've focused on increasing uh, diversity uh, in, in many different respects, both race and ethnic diversity and also gender diversity. Uh, I actually, when I was president of the Federal Bar Association, launched the first women in law conference in San Diego for the Federal Bar Association. Uh, because again, the, these are issues that are important to me. And I think particularly, uh, as you can tell if you're, if you're watching me, uh, as a white male, uh, these are experiences that I don't necessarily have, and it's important that uh, I be an advocate uh, for others that don't necessarily have the same opportunities I have. So that's what I've done in San Diego. That's what I will continue to do once elected, and certainly uh, with my staff, uh, if elected, I I'm very committed to having a diverse staff uh, in District 5. Thank you. Okay, Marnie, would you like me to restate the question, or do you have your... Would you like to restate it? Uh, no, it's okay. Um, thank you, though. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm really glad that San Diego has created an Office of Race and Equity that will exist into perpetuity because we're having a real national reckoning these past few months with 
uh, systemic racism and discrimination in our country. And by creating an office that looks at race and equity on every action we take, we're ensuring this isn't just a momentary fleeting conversation. This is actually going to lead to change that will help make sure we do better as a city. And, and we're the second largest city in California. So what we do here has a huge impact. And, you know, I've spent a lot of my life and career helping folks who are facing discrimination based on race or LGBTQ status or a medical condition such as having HIV. I opened a clinic in Mississippi. I got a $100,000 uh, grant from Skadden Arps Law Firm, a large law firm, uh, to open a clinic, a free legal clinic for people who needed access to justice in the Deep South to help pull themselves out of poverty and barriers they were facing. So this is really near and dear to my heart and making sure that we use the Office of Race and Equity to expand opportunities for everyone in our city is hugely important. You know, I've actually been in very close contact with our school boards for Poway Unified and San Diego Unified uh, because of the pandemic and knowing what's going on. And I've been endorsed by the presence of both organizations and they've been talking to me about how students are reacting to what happened this summer with George Floyd's murder. And there's a lot of um, black and African-American and a lot of uh, Indian American students who are finally talking about how they are, oh, are we done? Well, the, the timer went off. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to be done. I'm just, just cut, just wrap it up a little. <laughs> so there's four minutes for each of us. So Marnie, if I took some of your time, I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, no, don't worry. We'll, um, yeah, so uh, point being, we have very many levels that we can look at for making sure we expand opportunities. And I think, Joe, that's a great idea to talk about veterans as well. Talk about the disability community who is often excluded. But one thing we have learned that first come, first serve excludes a lot of people. So when we do talk about city services and contracts, maybe that's not how we do things. We make sure there's equity and that we wait till all applications come in and look on an equitable basis. So I'm happy to keep talking about it, but I think it's a great initiative. Thank you. The next question is, are you aware, and this is random, but uh, are you aware that Shabbat of Poway Shooter is from Rancho Penasquitas? Also, how diverse is your campaign staff? So I, I'm not really sure. I, I just, these are community questions. Uh, I think the question about Shabbat has to do with uh, gun control. What are your thoughts on gun control? Okay. In public spaces or access. Got it. Want me to go first this time? Yes, sure. Okay. Joe and I are learning. We're on so many great forums and we're both lawyers. <laughs> so we love talking. So you definitely need to cut us off. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, actually, I do know, sadly, that the um, person who murdered a woman at the Poway Synagogue and injured many others was a resident of Rancho Penasquitos. Also, I know that the shooter in, Den um, in Aurora, Colorado at the movie theater was from Rancho Penasquitos. And I actually found that out by knocking on doors in the primary and meeting some of their neighbors. And a lot of folks have asked me, Marnie, what are we gonna do about preventing gun violence? And one of my big platforms is making sure that we get a gun out of the hand of anyone who threatens a school, threatens a place of worship, threatens an office themselves or a partner. And we can do that through gun violence restraining orders. And actually law enforcement backs these. I've been talking, I work in law enforcement as a deputy city attorney. I work with our police every day. And I ask them, how have these been working out? Do you think they're useful tools? And the police have told me, yes. They at first were worried they'd be abused and you know people would make false claims, but they said it's not. Over the pandemic, we've had to take over 250 guns away from people who threatened to kill themselves. You know, suicide is actually one of the highest rates of gun death in San Diego County, and we don't talk about it enough. So I want to make sure we keep doing gun violence restraining orders. What they do is somebody can report in to law enforcement and we can go and get a gun out of a dangerous situation. And then that person has an opportunity to come to court and defend themselves and get it back if it turns out it was false. But if not, we can act on Facebook threats. We can act on things that don't seem normal. So that's a big proponent for me. I'm actually backed by San Diegans for Gun Violence Prevention, which has been a really big part of this. And it's not about taking away people's guns who are lawful gun owners. Honestly, I have no problem with responsible gun owners. That's not who I'm worried about. I'm worried about people who want to threaten to harm themselves or others. And so I'm glad you talked about it. In terms of a diverse campaign staff, yes, diversity is, is huge in my office. You know, I have one young African-American woman. I have a, a white Latina woman. I've got... Um, 
uh, a lot of Indian Americans interning on the campaign, young white men as well. Um, you know, we have Jewish, Christian, Hindu faith. So our office is fun. We get to celebrate almost every holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Joe. I guess I'll take the second question first, just jumping off of uh, what Marty said. I don't actually have that large of a staff um, <laughs> my campaign, but uh, but it's made up of women and uh, uh, underrepresented groups. Um, you know, again, it's such a small group that's actually paid on my staff that uh, I, I couldn't say that there's any, I couldn't even, you know, represent the percentages, but uh, that's on my campaign staff. Like I said earlier with my business uh, in my office where I have much more direct control on hiring uh, it's a very, very diverse, uh, very diverse staff, uh, and I'm very proud of that. And, and again, I think that's what is important in this world is bringing people together with different backgrounds, different perspectives, different life experiences. So, uh, again, it's something I'm committed to. Uh, with respect to um, you know the, the uh, shooter in Peña um, you know, yes, I was aware of that. I was also aware. Uh, of the shooter in, in Colorado being from Rancho Peña Escudo. So I learned that because I lived here when that happened in Colorado. And it was certainly noteworthy here and sad that uh, we had local connection to what was going on so tragically in Colorado. Um, and obviously, I think most of you probably know there was another, uh, there was an officer involved shooting last night um, mm -hmm. in Escudo uh, mm -hmm. based on a domestic, a domestic violence call. Um, and, and so, you know, in terms of gun control, to be frank, uh, it's not something that the city council has a whole lot of oversight in. Uh, as Marnie said, she's a deputy city attorney. The gun violence restraining orders that she's talking about are handled in the city attorney's office. Mm -hmm. uh, I have definitely been attacked by my opponent on my position on the Second Amendment. Uh, I support the Second Amendment. I don't know why other people, uh, it, you know, don't support all of the Bill of Rights. Uh, I support every aspect of the Bill of Rights, and that includes uh, the due process clause and i have no problem uh if if uh, firearms are taken from people that uh, are not using them lawfully or are a threat so long as their due process rights that they should be constitutionally guaranteed are followed uh and and that's uh kind of where i fall on that issue but again it's really something that uh, the city council does not have a whole lot of control over uh, but that's my view okay thank you wow we, we saved a few minutes <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to be the stopwatch person today. <laughs> no, please do. You're a great host. <laughs> Keep us on task. Yes. So we have the next question is, what is your position on Prop 16 and why? I guess I'm, I'm first this time. Okay, okay you're, let's, <laughs> let's do tag team back and back sure. forth. Sure, yeah. yeah. Sounds good. So, um, so I, I oppose Prop 16. Uh, I've been on the record opposing Prop 16. I frankly think that we should not divide ourselves further by things like, uh, you know, things like race. Um, and frankly, what I saw is I was at UC San Diego uh, when the University of California uh, eliminated race-based uh, admissions. And, you know, unfortunately, initially, uh, there was a decline in admissions for African American and Hispanic students, uh, but it, but shortly after, the school got much more creative, uh, figured out that if we admit students based on a certain socioeconomic region and not based on race, that the diversity actually increased, and we're actually a much more as a university, University of California, much more diverse student body. Uh, shortly after the elimination of race-based admissions than it was when we were using race-based race -based admissions. And so I've always said I certainly support uh, so looking at people's socioeconomic background and trying to make sure that those factors are considered in, in certain decisions, uh, you know, dis traditionally disadvantaged communities, for example. But doing it simply based on race or ethnicity, I think, is the wrong direction to go and uh, frankly, like I said, just divides us. Uh, one of the groups that frankly is most, in my view, most disadvantaged by race-based decision-making is our Asian American community. And there's a horrible history, frankly, of discrimination and uh, theft of wealth from our Asian American communities. Uh, the Japanese internment in World War II is one very clear example. Uh, and so again, from my standpoint to uh, you know, discriminate against, for example, our Asian American communities 
and sort of pick winners and losers based on race is the wrong way to go. I do think uh, socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic basis is a better way if we're going to try and, uh, if you will, level the playing field. Thank you. Okay, Marnie, same question. Yes. So, um, as I said before, I'm I'm glad that our country is finally having a a national reckoning again. Honestly, um, on systematic racism and lack of opportunity for everyone, and I am actually a product of affirmative action. My mother got into UCLA School of Business, which is now the Anderson School, in the early '70s as one of the first women ever to go, and they didn't permit women before, and there weren't even women's bathrooms. <laughs> they had to use one of the men's. Um, and so to me, that's what affirmative action is about, is just creating opportunity where there is none based on a characteristic we can't control, you know? Um, so, and I agree with, with Joe completely about this shouldn't be about discriminating further. And that's not what I think Prop 16 is about. I'm in favor of it because I do believe it's about equaling the playing field and leveling opportunity for everyone. It should not be the only factor we look at. Certainly not. You know, I'm, I'm not asking folks to vote for me just because I'm a woman at all. But I am highlighting the fact that women, for example, make much less money on average for the same job than men do. And women of color make much, much less on average than this for the same job than white men do. And so those are issues we have to address. You know, I actually used to work for Congressman Bobby Scott in Virginia. I was spent a year in the U.S. House of Representatives drafting national legislation on education and, and, and uh, policy or education and workforce policy. And he used to say, Marnie, if you measure something, it tends to improve. But if you don't pay attention to it, it's always going to be worse. And so that's what I believe this is doing, is helping us measure these systematic inequalities that we see every day in our country. So uh, I'm glad to be having these conversations and, and supporting these things. And obviously, socioeconomic background plays into it as well. It's one of the other many factors. People should be looked at holistically for who they are. But we can't turn a blind eye to the fact that we do have systematic racism going on. So, Got it. Thank you both. Okay, number four. This is a loaded question. Do you agree with the handling of COVID-19 by Governor Newsom and Mayor Faulkner? What would you do differently for District 5? So I guess I go first. It's your turn first. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yep. So making sure that we actually tackle our public health crisis by listening to public health experts and to science is a huge deal for me. I mean, that's how keeping us healthy is going to be the key to keeping our economy open. And this is actually my second health crisis I've been through. I served in the Peace Corps in Botswana in Sub-Saharan Africa in the early 2000s. And I spent two years taking care of children who were born with HIV, whose parents had died of AIDS. And I went to funerals every weekend for, I don't talk about this much, but four or five funerals a weekend, um, the amount of disease and death was really terrifying. And so I, I know what works and it's a consistent, public health message that everyone hears all the time and everyone knows how to get on board and, and works together. You know, what the biggest failure I've seen in our country with this pandemic is the fact that we have no coherent national strategy coming out of the White House. Even last night, our president said, maybe masks don't work, maybe they do, I don't know. And I just, I think that's gonna set us back for years. We have higher death rates in this country than most other industrialized countries. So for me, getting a consistent public health message that everyone can follow on billboards, on radio waves, on television, and these are simple things. You know, um, I actually work a lot with our homelessness chief of staff in the mayor's office, and I was talking to her about the convention center project with our homeless individuals. And I asked, why in San Diego are we having success in keeping COVID rates down among our homeless community, but LA and San Francisco, they're going through the roof. And she said, Marnie, we adopted face coverings, temperature checks, and health screenings before the governor even made it mandatory. And suddenly, by, by following those public health rules, we've had 7,000 COVID tests among 3,000 homeless people in our convention center, 21 positive cases. So, but the other half is the economy. You know, I don't necessarily think that now that we've learned a lot about the pandemic, I know why we do things on a county level, because that's how we dole out our health and human services, policy directives, and tax dollars. But now we've learned enough about the pandemic to know that maybe if we have an outbreak in SDSU, we can control it there and get resources there, but we might not have to shut down businesses up in Rancho Bernardo or, or Saber Spring or Scripps Ranch because they're just so far away. So I'm hoping we can really target, micro-target and learn to hit hotspots and that will help us direct resources to hotspots without having to shut down the whole economy everywhere else. But now that we know this more about the pandemic, I think that's what we can start to do is be more targeted in our resources and our public health direction. So. Be happy to keep talking about it. 
Okay. Okay, Joe. Your turn. Yeah, no, I, I agree that there has not been a consistent message uh, either at the federal level or at the state level. Um, you know, at the state level, for example, we keep having different metrics uh, that the governor is providing uh, for whether or not things can open or not open. And, um, and I think that's very challenging for not only the business community, but it's just challenging for us as citizens to know what to believe. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of inconsistent metrics that are being given to us. Uh, you know, initially masks were not recommended and, and then they became recommended, things like that, that are really, uh, to me, masks are no brainer. We should be wearing masks. Uh, but I'm not a scientist. And so if the scientists are saying it's not not mandatory, not recommended, then uh, you know it, it's tough for people to know what to do. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, you know, I, I've been criticized in this campaign uh, for a proposal I wrote, an op-ed I wrote, that called to support our public schools with financial resources so that they could safely reopen. Uh, it's the same, essentially the same proposal that the, gov uh, the mayor, I'm sorry, of San Francisco just mentioned today uh, in his frustration about the public schools in San Francisco not opening. Uh, you know, I do think that it's it's critically important that when it's safe, we try and get schools and businesses back open. Um, you know, mental health is a huge, huge uh, priority of mine, uh, you know, across the board. But certainly now when we see what's going on with, with COVID and the pandemic and people dealing with additional challenges, it's it's a critically important issue that we don't not lose sight of. And so again, when it's safe, we need to do what we can as policy makers uh, to make sure these things can open up. You know, just before I joined this, uh, this town hall, um, I unfortunately was uh, dealing with my sixth grader who was in tears. Uh, we're in Poway Unified. There's a board meeting yesterday. And the outcome of that board meeting, frankly, was uh, no real determination about when schools are going to open. As we can tell, it won't be this year. And she completely broke down in tears and was inconsolable because it's challenging. It's frustrating to be going to class as a kid through Zoom. Uh, I'd say almost every day there's either tears or yelling in my house. And it's sometimes from the kids and sometimes from the parents. Uh, but almost every day there's tears or yelling. And, you know, that's that's hurting kids uh, in District 5, uh, but frankly, it's probably hurting kids in other areas even more. The, the areas where, uh, you know, we have we have more blue collar workers, for example, who, who can't stay home with their kids. And we have kids that are going, doing their schoolwork remotely without any parent supervision. Uh, you know, the, the, when we talk about equity and the disparity in education systems, having our schools stay closed just absolutely exacerbates that. And, uh, and so again, I think, in terms of you know the mayor, the governor, our president, uh, all leaders across the board, I think you know it's important that we have consistent messaging. Uh, and, and as we learn new things, obviously we, we need to course correct. But consistent mm -hmm. messaging across the board is probably the most important thing that we could we could be receiving from our policymakers. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Due to the no touch policy, no contact sports, youth sports, this is uh, another outlet that is severely impacted uh, in our, well, everywhere, but specifically in San Diego. And many youth sports teams uh, that can afford it are leaving the state to play or leaving San Diego to other cities, ignoring the state mandates or playing games locally as scrimmage. So they're they're go, they're opting to go play somewhere else where they can actually play their game versus do a no-touch scrimmage. Um, what are your thoughts on playing new sports in San Diego during COVID? I think I'm first this time. Yeah, it, yes. I, I've heard I've heard about that. Um, you know, my kids are all doing uh, youth sports. It was all completely locked down initially, no activity in their in their sports. Um, and then now it's it's eased up some. And again, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a health expert. I don't know what is considered safe and what's not considered safe. But what I do see, and I think this is the frustration that I was talking about earlier, is you get these inconsistent messages. And so even in San Diego, 
my club soccer player kid uh, is practicing, but they can't do scrimmages. But other club soccer programs are doing scrimmages. Um, and so, again, it's very frustrating. And as you said, a lot of parents, a lot of teams are actually driving to other states where the rules are less restrictive. And so uh, it, it really is a shame. And again, it goes back to what I was saying before about equity as well. Uh, you know, most families, I think, don't have the time and resources to be driving to other states for their kids to be <laughs> playing sports. Uh, but that's what we've gotten to. I mean, it's a little bit, uh, I don't want to say silly, because again, I completely understand the desire to have your kids playing those sports, uh, especially some of the older kids that are maybe high school age, for example, where they've been playing a particular sport for their entire academic career and are hoping to continue to play in college, maybe even you know get a scholarship and to have this time where they're not actually practicing in terms of you know the, the games and getting better in terms of playing games. Uh, it, it can be a real, uh, no pun intended, but sideliner for, for some of these kids. And yeah. so I understand, you know, I understand the desire to do that. Um, and, and it just highlights really some of the inconsistency in how these rules are being applied and why I think so many people are getting more and more frustrated. Thank you. Marnie? Yeah, um, yeah, I actually I swam and I played water polo all throughout school and I definitely understand why it'd be really frustrating not to get to be outside, see your friends, see your team and you know, the socio I mean the socio emotional health of our children and our youth in our community is suffering because of, but everyone is suffering under this pandemic. This has been a real emotional load for all of us. And I hope we can all take the time to have a little patience with ourselves and others that we might have lost our temper with or lost our temper with ourselves because of all the stress of this. So I definitely understand the desire to want to play sports. I agree with you, Joe. Um, but I, I honestly defer to our public health experts um, and our parents and our coaches and our schools to decide when it's best to be getting students together and, and safe to do so. Um, we see what's happening with some of our, our you know college campuses opening and closing again and a few of our high schools because COVID is still a very deadly disease and it's a still a big risk for a lot of people. So um, just want to make sure everyone's safe, but also the city can help be a partner in improving things for youth and sports once we figure out what the science is. And so we can actually do joint use agreements for our public recreation centers and our fields to make sure that schools can have more space to open up into, or our, we can use our libraries for extra classroom space to have social distancing and allow students to be separated and apart. So I think there's a lot of things the city can do to be more flexible and nimble to make sure we actually do get people back to the most normal they can right now. You know, for small businesses, for example, I, as a deputy city attorney, I also draft ordinances. And I helped write the law that allowed businesses to open up onto parking lots and sidewalks and got to make sure we still have, you know, ADA parking and let people walk by. But it's been working very well, especially because in San Diego, we can be outside uh, most of the year. So that's the kind of, nim um, you know, nimble, flexible city I want us to have that's responsive to people's needs. And if someone in the public health arena or in the science arena says, hey, it turns out playing this kind of sport outdoors for kids is not a risk, let the city be a great partner in making that happen. So... That's how I'd approach it. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. The aging population of District 5. District 5 uh, aging population in the last uh, census had grown 17.5%. Uh, with this, these last 10 years, what changes do you see the city doing for District 5 to make it more livable for the aging population? My first, okay, all right. Um, yes, yeah, so I, that's a really great question. You know, as I said earlier, my parents still live in the house that I grew up in here in Scripps Ranch. And, you know, I've seen a lot of health challenges that my parents, my friends' parents have all faced. I've gone and talk to a lot of different senior groups. Now it's all on Zoom, but before the pandemic, I got to go in and meet folks. And a lot of the concerns I heard from seniors in our district is that they don't have transportation anymore. It's, you know, a lot of people can't drive. Um, I met a gentleman named Harold, who's a World War, or is a Vietnam vet, and he couldn't get to the uh, Ralphs down the street from him, or the Albertsons, right in, in Rancho Bernardo, because there were no curb cuts on his sidewalks, and he couldn't use his wheelchair. 
and simple things like that. I met a, um, a woman who works very heavily with the Seven Oaks community in Rancho Bernardo and with the Seven Oaks Community Center. And she said, we need a stop sign because seniors trying to cross the street to get to the community center have almost been hit by cars. And so it's just making sure we pay attention to these issues and having an office that can really look at what seniors need. I'm actually on the San Diego County Bar Associations. I'm the vice chair of our elder law section because protecting seniors has been a big part of my work. Um, we do a lot of protection of seniors who face a lot of scams during the COVID crisis. A lot of people are getting phone calls about get Medicare or Medi-Cal benefits or so you just give us your social security numbers over the phone. Nobody will ever ask for that over the phone. Um, so education is a big part of it. Transportation, especially to hospitals and doctors, is a huge part of what I think our seniors need. Um, and just making sure we actually account for folks. You know, our, our, our county board is really what disperses a lot of aging tax dollar money for us um, for aging and senior services because they're the health and human services entity of our government. And they've noticed a lot of our senior centers are dilapidated and need repairs. And so I think we have to focus on that. And I'm glad you brought that up. Joe? Yeah, you know, one of the first uh, places I actually spoke with when I was going down this road was the, the Gary and Mary West uh, organization that's focused on seniors. And one of the important things that they're focused on is how do we make sure that our senior population can stay in their homes and have that independence as long as possible? Because I know that's really a high priority as people age. And, you know, one of the things I think that's most important, and frankly, where, where Marty and I disagree, is I think we need to make sure your property taxes don't get increased. That's part of the reason Prop 13 was passed in the first place, because people are having a hard time in California with the rate at which our property values go up, staying in their homes, especially once they retired and were on fixed incomes. And so again, I, I strongly oppose Measure A that would increase property taxes. And that's, again, somewhere where, where Marty and I disagree. But I think it's critically important. People should not be forced out of their homes as they're aging because they can't afford them anymore. I also think we need to make sure we have the resources for our senior population here. You know, we are in a high threat area when it comes to fire. I, I say District 5 is unique in the fact that we are, uh, we have more fire threat than any other district in the city. Uh, we, I personally evacuated twice in the 2007 fires and again in 2014. And, and so I think I worry, frankly, about our senior population. And I'd like to see us actually adopt uh, almost like a neighborhood watch system for our senior population, where we have neighbors who say, I will check on my senior neighbor uh, when there's an evacuation and make sure they have the help they need to get out of their home in the next emergency, in the next fire. Because again, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So I think it's critically important that we make sure our senior population in District 5 have access to the services they need and the help they need so they can stay in their homes as long as possible. I, I agree. Okay, we have another question. Um, if you're, if our businesses cannot open, there will be no econom economy left. What are your, what do you recommend to get the economy going again? Just, I'm going to focus and keep emphasizing District Five. How sure. I know you guys are both going to go sit at the table for the whole city, but District 5 seems to be a very good revenue resource for everybody else to spend. So I would like to, to just emphasize District 5 tonight that you know we our businesses are suffering, which you know is that domino effect. So the question is, um, and it's a statement, if our businesses can't open. What are we going to do? What's the what's the contingency plan for survival? Yeah. And I think that's a real conversation. And I don't think many people want to talk about that. But the deficit of the city right now is pretty impressive. So what what do you what can, what are you going to bring to the party to navigate forward? So, Kate, I appreciate the question. And I, and I think Frank asked it during the conversation about about COVID or made the statement during the conversation about COVID. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, I do want to, I do want to clarify something that you just said, Kate, if I'm elected to the city council, I'm there to represent district five. I'm not there to represent the entire city. Now that doesn't mean that often what's good for the entire city isn't also good for district five. 
but we moved to district elect elections to be advocates for our district. And I would make sure to be an advocate for district five. And you're right. District five has some really strong businesses. And even before COVID, I was focused on how do we bring better and more business and employment opportunities here in district five, for example, in the Rancho Bernardo business center. So I'd, I'd like to see more and more companies choose to relocate here in San Diego as opposed to the Bay Area and places like that. But specifically to Frank's question with COVID, again, as a business owner, uh, I understand what he's, I understand why he's making that statement and, and really concerned. I talk to business owners all the time since COVID has hit. Unfortunately, business owner after business owner that's laid off people, uh, business owner after business owner that's closed. I just talked to one this week who closed her sandwich stop, shop in Rancho Peña Skidos. She has a few other locations but with COVID, the lease was up and she said, I'm not going to take that risk. I'm just going to close it down. And that's happening more and more because of because, frankly, these businesses can't open to full capacity. Again, the health and safety has to be the first and foremost priority. But I do think a lot of the regulations are arbitrary. When you say to a restaurant, you can only have 25 percent capacity. Well, that might be a floor. But if a certain restaurant is willing to put plexiglass between tables, require masks to be worn, you know, longer inside the, the restaurant or take other safety precautions that they could show to health officials that they're just as safe at, let's say, 50 percent capacity than some other restaurant at 25 percent capacity. Why would we not let them do that? Again, if, if they can show to health and safety officials that they can do it, we should give them that opportunity and that option. And so I completely agree with Frank's statement. We need to give businesses the opportunity to show how they can expand what they're doing now in in safe and healthy ways, uh, what, you know, obviously while still protecting the community at large. I think we've all used this example before, the fact that even in the beginning of COVID, we had thousands of people a day probably walking through you know, Costco and Walmart uh, <laughs> yes. in the early stages without masks, uh, yes. you know, grocery stores, and, and we're still seeing that. And yet it was the mom and pops, you know, that were, were having to be closed and were really hurting and didn't have the reserves to, to survive in a lot of cases. So, you know, we, def we definitely need to see how we can have businesses safely expand operations, because as Frank says, if we don't, they're not going to be, there's not going to be any economy left to survive. Thank you. Marnie. Yes. Um, no, Frank, that's a really great point. And that's the hardest part about this entire pandemic is the balance between keeping people safe and healthy because they can't show up to a work if a business is open if they have COVID. But if we don't have a business for them to go to when they're healthy and they lose a job, then they can't pay rent or their mortgage or, or put, put food on the table. So I completely understand the tension in this issue. Um, I think it would be wonderful, honestly, if we had more industry leaders at the table deciding a lot of these public health issues and putting input in. Uh, like Joe said, I understand, I've heard from a lot of small business owners that it, you know, at restaurant capacity at 25%, you're barely even making it on a margin with full capacity. So it's very hard to actually operate at 25%. But I'd love that to have more expertise at the table on how to safely operate a restaurant, how to operate a gym in, in COVID. You know, I don't know, I'm not a gym owner, but I'd love to listen to you to hear how to do it because I, I miss my yoga studios. I went back, you know, when it was safe. And of course I'll stay away when it's not because I want to make sure my yoga teachers are, are, are safe too. But I understand that and making sure that we do have an economy that stays open. One of the things I want to work on more is enforcing laws against bad actors who ruin it for all of us. So we don't have to close down the economy. So as a city attorney, I was getting some complaints about, um, as I said, I'm a civil prosecutor. I go, you know, I go after businesses that break the law or cut corners and that, harms law-abiding businesses. I'm standing up for the businesses who are doing this right. And I heard about a couple of Vaughn stores at Pacific Beach where we had a her early out outbreak of the pandemic this summer. And a lot of our grocery store workers were being yelled at and spit on when they were asking customers to wear face coverings. And so I wrote a letter um, on city attorney letterhead, which is a really low cost way to get something done. And I got a call immediately from the Grover International General Counsel herself, who said, oh my gosh, we are so sorry. We, this is not our corporate policy. We definitely will make sure there's a security guy that they're asking customers to keep everyone safe. And because of that, we were able to keep COVID rates down and not shut down. And so it, that's the thing is we have to make sure the bad actors don't ruin it for all of us. 
so that we can keep our economy open. And that's the key to me is keeping people healthy will keep our economy open. But I'd love to hear more about how industries, specific industries can come to the table and give us recommendations, give our public health experts recommendations and be heard. So I think that's a really good idea. Fantastic. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, Okay, so that's it on those questions uh, that have come in from the community. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Would you, would either of you like to take this opportunity to deliver five minutes? We've got 15 minutes, so we've got to give you both five minutes to really deliver what you want people to take away from you, their time with you tonight. Their time's valuable, their time's important, and I would love for you to, to give them something to take away and think about tonight. So Marty, you go first. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, well, first of all, thank you for participating. And Kate, thank you for hosting. I mean, having these conversations about what we want our city to look like, especially during this crisis is hugely important. So I really value everyone's opinion. And I been wanna tell everyone that at the end of the day, no matter who wins this race, if it's me or Joe, if I, you know, if I win, I don't take any of these things personally. If you had Joe's yard sign in your yard, that's fine. Come talk to me. This is not about me. This is about good governance. And I'm sure Joe feels the same way, honestly. Um, and I will, I'll call Joe immediately. And I think we both are so invested in our city that we'll share ideas no matter who wins this race. But um, I want to talk a little bit also about uh, my thought and decision-making process in terms of whether I support measures, for example. So Joe brought up Measure A, which is a housing bond to help uh, homeless individuals and, and create affordable housing so that we can finally get people off the street and create housing that we need. Um, I decided to support Measure A, especially because the San Diego, Tax, San Diego County Taxpayers Association endorsed this measure as a fiscally responsible measure. Um, they have realized, as I have, that the city spent over $100 million on homelessness and we're not getting anywhere because a lot of it's temporary shelters that don't adequately implement things like uh, addiction treatment, mental health treatment. There aren't places for youth to go or domestic violence victims to really be safe. And so I really was swayed by that. And they said, we will actually be using money more wisely if we pass this bond to actually create housing that continue the cycle of homelessness on the, excuse me, on the streets. But I also looked at what it would actually do. And so homeowners of anyone who owns a home of 600,000 600, or more the average assessment would be around $112 a year. And so I understand what Joe's saying about keeping seniors in their home and Prop 13 needs to stay in place for, for residential properties. I completely understand. But I, I just didn't think that the $116 a year would actually put anyone out of their home. And if it will, we need to talk about that and call me because that means an economic security problem that we really need to address. Um, I also want folks to know that I'm going to be able to bring experience to District 5. Um, you know, I will represent District 5. And like Joe said, District 5 is first and foremost our responsibility as a city council member. But we also ha do have to make decisions for the entire city. When we vote on a budget, that budget affects all of us here in District 5. If we're spending 100 million on homelessness that affects a lot of places downtown, that's gonna affect our tax dollars up here. So we do have to have a citywide mind, although District 5 needs to be our primary interest for sure. Um, I'm also be gonna be able to hit the ground running. You know, We're gonna have five new city council members coming up in December in the middle of a crisis. And I'm only one of two candidates running citywide who has experience at City Hall. I've spent years drafting ordinances, advising the mayor and the city council in closed session. I know all the heads of departments. I know what issues we need to have sticking points on. I know what we don't, and I'll know who to call when something comes across my desk. You know, we really can't afford to wait on any of these things. You know, our, our budget issue is gonna be a huge issue. And I've been talking a lot to different people who are working on the budget. And luckily the city's hiring freeze right now has really helped to cut costs down. Our sales tax luckily has not gone plummeted as much as we thought it would because of the recent change in state law that allowed us to get sales tax from internet sales, which have gone through the roof since we're all at home and need things delivered to our homes right now. Um, but our TOT tax is taking a huge hit. And one of the things I wanna see us get back into is being the safe tourist town to come to. And that's the key. If we are safe and people know they can come here and they're driving for a beach trip for a weekend and any of our hotels are clean and safe and people will not get COVID and have issues, then we will get tourism back. And that will be the key, having a safe, healthy economy. But I also want folks to know that I have an open door. 
if you have an issue you want me to know about, please call me. Um, I give out my number and it goes to this phone. I answer it all the time. These people text me, they email me. I was um, putting my flyer on a door in Rancho Bernardo two weeks ago and I got an email from the mother who retrieved it and said, I have a Cub Scout troop I'd really love you to talk to. Can you get on their next Zoom meeting for their den meeting? And I did last night. So please reach out to me. Um, I wanna hear from you because this is your city and I wanna be a good elected representative. Constituent services is gonna be a huge part of my priorities because if we can't serve the people that we represent, then we shouldn't be there. So thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm excited and Joe, it's been really great to run with you on this campaign trail. Um, you know, uh, thanks Kate for hosting and I'm looking forward to continuing our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Kate, for hosting. Thank you, Marnie, for being here. Um, and uh, it's always uh, it's always good to see you. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm running not because I'm one of 11,000 people that work for the city. I'm running because this is where my wife and I are raising our kids. Uh, you know, my kids have played uh, on almost all of the fields in District 5, given all the different sports they've done since my first one was born almost 13 years ago. Uh, you know, soccer and baseball and now lacrosse and, uh, you know, football. Uh, we've been all over this district. And <laughs> and again, and, and we've got some great parks and some great fields and some great community centers. And we need to keep those that way. Uh, and, and we need to make that a priority. And, you know, I'm running because, again, I really feel like we we are not making progress as a city. Uh, we need somebody that that comes with business experience that says if we're if we're not making success if we're not reaching success in the way we're approaching something how do we do it differently not how do we do it the same not how does the city do it today because that's what we need to do the next four years it's how do we do it differently so we actually get better results and that's why i decided to put my career on hold to spend less time with my family my kids i love and my wife i love i wish i could spend more time with them but that's why i'm going down this road and you know, we need to prioritize some of the basics, especially when in a budget crisis. We need to protect our public safety. We need to make sure we're investing in our police and our fire. And that's got to be one of the top, top priorities of local government. We need to invest in our roads and other infrastructure. Uh, you know, people really uh, get frustrated, understandably, when they pay so many tax dollars and drive over road, roads that are like a third world country. Uh, we need to really, we really need to make that a priority. Uh, you know, there's a there's a something even if I don't win, I'm very proud of uh, a, a constituent reached out to me in February when she saw me on, on a TV station talking about the roads. And she said, you know, Joe, I have not been able to get my road fixed for 20 years. It's been the same problem. The city comes out every six months or so, patches it up. And then, you know, two weeks, three weeks later, there's water coming up out of the road. And so I went and I checked it out. And then I talked to city staff and the city staff said, we'll come take a look. And you know what they did? The exact same thing they've been doing for 20 years. They patched it up. I told the, the homeowner, I said, you know, they, they said they fixed it. She said they did the same thing they've been doing for 20 years. So again, month goes by, I check it out again. Sure enough, the road looks horrible. There's water in the middle of the road. I push on city staff again. And they said, you know, it's, it's sprinkler runoff. There's spr someone's overwatering in the road and that's causing the water and the potholes. So I go and I check out the road again, 85 degrees, about 1230 in the afternoon, bone dry everywhere except the middle of the road. So I push again on the city staff. They finally come out, they test the water, they find out there's no chlorine in it, which means it's not a, it's not city water, it's coming up from the ground. And literally last week, they dug up the road, put a drain in, repaved the road. And this voter who frankly, has never voted for anybody but a Democrat before, said I've got her vote. Because she said, if Joe can do this as a private citizen, imagine what he can do when he's in City Hall. And that's a, that's the thing. We, we can't be doing the same thing we've been doing for 20 years. We have to be approaching things differently. We have to be pushing on the city bureaucracy and making sure they deliver for us in a better way. That's why I'm running. And that's what I want to do when I'm elected to represent you. Uh, again, you know, Marnie and I, I think, I think we're both great people. We're both committed to service. We definitely have some different views on, on where we should go going forward. Uh, my website is joeforsandiego.com. You can learn more about me there. And if you had questions that you didn't get a chance to ask tonight, I'd be glad to answer them if you reach out through me on my contact form. So thank you very much.
Okay, so let's just say your websites one more time for both both of you. So Joe, yeah, uh, yours is Joe. Say yours again. Yeah, it's hopefully easy to remember. Joe for San Diego dot com. It's not the letter. It's it's F O R E. Correct. F O R. Okay. okay, so yeah. And mine is a mar marni m a r n i for f o r san diego dot com. And uh, Joe, that's a great story, especially as a city attorney who sees the lawsuits who come in when we don't invest in our infrastructure. Had a business flooded or a street flood, we would have been paying on the back end to solve the damages in that case. So I'm just really, that's why we have to be proactive in our infrastructure. We're not saving money by not investing in our infrastructure. So thanks for saving the taxpayers a lawsuit and saving me time <laughs> to spend it. I'm all about saving the taxpayers. Yes, exactly. Me too. Me too. It's a really good point though. You know, we have to make sure that we are investing practically. <laughs> well, what seems, what's so refreshing is that one, one plus out of this COVID is that we've, we've taken on um, instant platforms mm -hmm. and become more accessible for real dialogue and real transparency and real accountability. So I think that means that we have better ways moving forward to actually be more proactive and get things done for our community. <clears throat> so I, I look forward to uh, collaborating and, and being that listening for our community to address the things that are important to them. I know in, in our little part of the world, uh, roads are important. Uh, Food scarcity for middle-income families has become a real priority. Um, access to COVID testing locally. Mm -hmm. These things are not, these things are new conversations. They're new in our experience of life. So having uh, leadership that is available and accessible, who is willing to take up the gauntlet and run with it and get results within a week and not two years, um, is what we're looking for. You know, I think resilience and adaptability is are the key words for 2020. Resilience mm -hmm. and adaptability and kindness. So mm -hmm. teaching our children to be resilient and adaptable, being kinder to one another. Uh, nobody's, nobody's to blame. We're in it together. Yeah. So let's work on this together. And I so value and appreciate the quality of candidates that we have before us. It's refreshing. I just, <laughs> just thank you so much. Um, I'd like to share another comment from uh, town council, a prior town council secretary, Erin Chinchill. Thank you for popping on here tonight. Um, our parents and our families, we really do value and appreciate what goes on um, from the leadership roles at city council we listen to you you represent our needs and we are here to partner with you for a better future and the way forward so we're actually done early so is there anything else anyone else would like to ask our guests tonight <laughs> well, just kate i want to thank you for everything you and the town council do and uh and also i, I don't know if people make sure people know spectacular is coming up as well oh it's off the rails you know we're gonna it is we have been so blessed uh we have got over 1500 respondents great that will be in attendance next friday night because and we will be celebrating this, the holidays, the Halloween mm -hmm. spectacular safely. So there's the ingenuity, right? Resilience, yep. adaptability. Mm -hmm. We're we're driving through. So you're gonna decorate your car, decorate your kids, get, you know, put a mask on the dog, just <laughs> trick out the ride, and come bop mm -hmm. to the music to um, dance and groove DJs. Who's gonna have a whole light show, and we have students from Bach to Rock, they're gonna be doing different musical aspects mm -hmm. throughout the drive-through and um, Penasquitas Lutheran Church. So it is truly community in action, coming together mm -hmm. and making it happen. It's all yep. volunteer, it's all volunteer. So yep. this is this is what it's all about. So we mm -hmm. can do anything mm -hmm. when we just open up the conversation. Yeah, it's, it's volunteer, all, but it's also good leadership. Kate, you should give yourself some credit. Honestly, you've been doing so much for our community. Um, I, I, you instantly started a wonderful Facebook group for all of us to, you know, the cheer, 
shelter in place, cheer up from home. That was your first action. And I thought that was really compassionate to make sure that we stayed connected as a community, even though we had to be physically distant. So, and no surprise that Spooktacular is doing so well because you're <laughs> so. I'm just trying to balance out the spookies with the, I want the great pumpkin, right? And everybody else wants that scary guy with the mask. <laughs> 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 but truly, truly, we are here to support the interests of Rancho Penasquitas and deal with issues that matter in that it means it, tough talking issues of um, racial inequality. Those are hard conversations, but we embrace them with love, respect, and a willingness to, to create new pathways forward and not leave anyone behind. So, you know, we're here to make a difference, heart to heart, elbow to elbow, um, safely. We can do it. Absolutely. So, Agreed. Um, I'm, I'm so encouraged with the leadership opportunities and um, possibilities that you guys are going to bring to the table. It's just very inspirational. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. We are now, we have concluded our first ever Rancho Penasquitas. Wonderful. City of San Diego, District 5 Community Forum. And I thank you both for being with, our, with us tonight and look forward to our time together. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Rancho Penasquitas, for your questions and, and showing up. Make a yep. difference. Okay. And happy Halloween, everyone. That's right. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Carol. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>